Genesis 26, 18 tells us Isaac dug again the wells of Abraham. In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. Hi, I'm Gene Bailey. Welcome to Revival Radio TV. We're always looking on how to be the one, whether it's in the past or in the future. Sometimes it's easy to do that. And sometimes, you know, it takes a dream or a vision to birth something that hasn't even been created yet. A whole generation is here that never knew what it was not like to have a smartphone, internet, or television 24 hours a day. How about you? Has your life been impacted? Maybe you know someone who has been saved or healed through watching Christian television. Maybe you were. Are you one of our viewers who can remember when television and the internet, whoever heard of the internet, hadn't even started airing or streaming? What about your first Christian television show? Can you remember that one? Today I have a guest you probably never heard of, yet his vision changed all of our lives. As we go into this interview with my friend, Dale Hill, my question is this, what does he have in common with Pat Robertson, Jim Baker, and Paul Crouch? We've been around a long time. We have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, most people don't, or a lot of the people watching know my history from PTL, and that's where I met you first. Mm -hmm. yes. But we're actually connected a little bit further back than that. And I want to talk a little bit about your history. Christian television has been a major part of not just uh, technology and the moving of God, but it gives part in revival history as well. Oh, absolutely. So let's go back to the first time you got involved with Christian television. Take us back to 1966? Six, yeah. I did, yeah. What happened? <laughs> well, um, you know, my father was a pastor, so I grew up in a, in a around a lot of revival. Yeah. You know, because when he pastored when I was young, we traveled a lot. He was always going to the next town or the next area where there was a move of God. And so he took me to see William Brannan and people like that, even though I was quite young. And he was very involved with do you, all. Do you remember any of the William Brannan? I do. It's really interesting because it was so unique. There's no two Holy Spirits. And that same Holy Spirit that led Simeon that night or that morning to the Christ has led you here tonight because you believe the promise of the Holy Spirit. And he's just as obligated to you as he was to Simeon. The same because he's God and he has to keep his word. Then I can see Simeon, he craved, he desired to see the Christ. He believed what the word of God had said to him, no matter what the critics said, he believed the word of God. There was a yearning in his heart to see the Christ, and he believed he would. As David said, when the deep calleth to the deep. Many of you in here believe in divine healing. Do you? You believe in divine healing. The very reason that you believe in divine healing proves there is a divine healing. That just intrigued me I you know, as a young boy. Yeah, because back then people didn't line up against the wall. and have, I mean, the no. whole line thing was kind of unusual. Correct. Yeah. That... that that's what I'm saying. That was new. Now, you know, my dad, uh, Pentecostal holiness, you know, very, you know, Holy Spirit led services. So I was used to seeing the move of God. Seeing a person healed was not strange to me. That was pretty normal. Right. And, um, but to see it in that, first that size meeting, I'd never been in that size meeting before. And then to see uh, the way he just had that word of knowledge, that, that's the first time I'd seen mm -hmm. that level and so it had really an impact on me as a young child. So there you are, okay? And so you grew up in church and traveling. So, I mean, you, you were quite accustomed. So how did you get from there to uh, beginnings of Christian television? Well, um, we, we grew up rather poor, and my dad moved uh, pastors at, 
you know, where he was pastored to a Chesapeake, which was near Norfolk, you know, area, and took a larger church. And so we moved. I had just turned 13 and uh, went to, started going to school there. But I was gone during the summer working on a farm and I would come home right before school started and go back to school. But right. um, so I was away for the summer. I was 15. I turned 16 while I was away. Of course, back then everything was about, hey, I have to have the money to buy a car. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, my dad's uh, theory was if you, if you worked and paid for it, you could have it, you know? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so of course I'm looking for a job. And while I was gone, he had discovered that there was a new Christian television station in the city which, you know, as you know, this was before cable, before any of that. Right. So there are only three television stations in town, your three major networks. So here was a fourth station, but it was a Christian station. Prior to that, we didn't even own a television. So while I was away that summer, I came home and there's a television in the house and dad's showing me this. And uh, that particular day, Pat Robertson mentioned that they were looking for some, some people to that could employ. And uh, I looked at Dad, I said, I'm looking for a job. So I, I, I went to the station to tell you how small it was. We arrived on an afternoon, no appointment, walk in, and I just said, I'm here to see Pat Robertson to talk to him about a job. And five minutes later, I'm in his office sitting yeah. in front of him. So <laughs> <laughs> things have changed quite a bit, obviously. Yeah. And uh, he took me in the studio, which was... 25 by 25 to tell you how small it was. Wow. And, but then, you know, I'm just like shocked. I'm looking around. It was the biggest thing, I, you know, especially to a kid who grew up in, sure. you know, on a farm. You know, this was quite unique. And um, we talked for a while and uh, he said, you sure you want to work here? I said, I, I believe I do. And he said, well, I tell you what, you go home and pray about it for three days. At the end of three days, if you want the job, come back and it's yours. Well, you know, three days later, I'm, I'm back, I'm ready. Yeah. And so that's how I started. And uh, television was so new then. It was just uh, everything, you know, we were trying everything and uh, almost all programs were live. We didn't even have videotape back then. We ran a couple film shows, but for right. the most part, programs were live. And because the studio was so small, you know, we had to stagger how we set up so we could, in that minute and a half break between programs, we could set up for the next one. Right. So it was, it was quite interesting. So uh, tell me about, so you're, you're involved in the birth of Christian television, really, at this point. I know you have to have some stories of God showing up there. Well, it was um, <clears throat> about the time we started 700 Club, which was about a year later, uh, Jim Baker had I'd always wanted to do a talk show. Yeah. Because prior to that, there were a lot of teaching shows and uh, ministry shows, but there wasn't really talk shows as we see today. And Jim kept saying to Pat, I really want to do a Johnny Carson type show. Right. And so we were doing the 700 Club Telethon, which, mean, which meant we needed 700 people to give $10 a month. That was our budget. Yeah. And so uh, finally, during that whole telethon, Jim kept saying, Pat, I really want to do this talk show. And Pat said, well, you'll have to do it at night, you know, and all that. And Jim said, that's fine, I'll do it. So we started this 700 Club the day after the telethon, and we just dropped the word telethon. So it became 700 Club. Yeah. And uh, they, the first 700 Clubs were pretty much prayer meetings. Right. And Jim's agreement with, with Pat and the staff was, as long as people were calling in on the prayer line and getting saved or healed, we'd stay on the air. We were scheduled to go off yeah. at 11 o'clock. Rarely did we go off at 11 o'clock. We very often would be on the air till midnight, one, two. One morning, I think it was 5.30 a.m. We went off the air. I mean, it was just amazing. Man. But because the other stations went off at 1 a.m. back then. You were the only game in town. We were the only thing in town. And wow. We had people watch us who certainly weren't Christians. Sure. Because there was nothing else on and they would watch and... There were a lot of late night salvations and it affected that whole region because not only were we getting people saved, but Jim was preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was extremely new yeah. to a lot of the people there. And so 
there were, I mean, I can remember more than once, uh, I don't want to say how many times, but more than one time, the presence of God came in the studio so thick that we just would lock the cameras down and the entire staff would go in the studio and just wow. be there in a prayer meeting and the people at home saw one camera and whatever audio they heard because we were all in the studio worshiping God. So there was some pretty amazing moves of God back then. You were telling me a story the other day about the time you didn't have money for payroll. Right. What happened? Well, very often in those early years, uh, you know, the ministry would run out of money. And uh, more than one time, Pat would call the staff together and, and say, you know, we just don't have the money to make payroll this week. Um, can you work with us? Can you help us? You know, and none of us ever complained about it, I don't think. I, I mean, I don't remember any complaining. I remember everybody going, well, I've got to figure out how to get till next week. Um, but everyone had such a heart to see this move forward. There was a real desire on the staff. They, they weren't just there to be paid. They were there for the ministry. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, I was making 75 cent an hour, so and that, that was big money to me back then. Yeah. But to not get it, you know, I had to borrow some money from my parents or whatever just to get through till the next week. But God always took care of us and we made it. But, you know, it just proved how all in everyone was, you know, to see this succeed. Yeah. You mentioned something, and we kind of want to go off the story just a little bit. The, the staff was so, you know, you were saying there wasn't much uh, complaining because everybody was engaged, right. would you say? Why do you think that was? I think as a staff, you know, there was a gentleman there who you remember, his name was Bill Garthwaite. Mm -hmm. On Sunday, Bill and his wife and his daughter were the only other people there besides me. And the four of us ran the station for the day. Hmm. on Sunday. And it, it was, you know, Bill's thing was this, was, this is what we do. You know, he just took it as his ministry, even though he was, you know, he was in charge of production, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't, you know, an on-air person or anything, but he knew Sunday <clears throat> he was responsible to make this, this station work. And very often, Saturday and Sunday in those early years, it was Bill and his wife and his daughter running the station. Hmm. And they just, it, it, it was their life. And so... I think those early years, there was a real commitment to see this technology be used for the kingdom. At six o'clock in the, in the evening, the only thing that was on television was news on the other three stations. All three ran news. Well, we did a kids program at oh. six o'clock. So the kids actually, you know, really started talking about it in school started telling their other friends about it saying, have you seen this show? Cause you know, kids don't want to watch news. And again, this was pre-cable, pre-internet, pre-any of that. So I really believe that, that God in his wisdom used the children's program to build Christian television mm. because the kids were getting their mom and dad. Back then you had to have a converter box mm -hmm. to get a UHF station. We were channel 27. So you had to have, you know, the tuners would only go to 13. You had to buy a converter box. So the kids would just go to their mom and dad and say, I want that so I can watch the kids' program. So the kids took over the televisions back then. And never gave them back. And never, yeah, <laughs> never gave them back. But, the, but I think that God used that to get the signal in homes. Mm. And that was the, I think that was the beginning of Christian television. And obviously uh, it grew from there. But um, in 19, about 1972, uh, Pat wanted to go you know, one way and Jim wanted to go another way with, with television. So there was a little bit of disagreement. So, so Jim actually left and um, he, was, he traveled for a while, but he ended up in California. So he called me and asked me to come to California and that's where TBN was started. In 1973, Paul and Jan received a call from God and launched the Trinity Broadcasting Network on a small UHF station in Southern California. The vision was for a fully owned and operated Christian television station. The early days were filled with struggles and the fledgling station was often on the brink of extinction. But Paul and Jan persevered and God answered their prayers with miracle after miracle. 
So he left there and went to California and met Paul Crouch. And mm. uh, they worked together to start TBN. And then, so then they operated there for a while, right. launched TBN. Launched TBN. We were there for a little over a year. And um, Jim goes, to, we had an affiliate in Charlotte uh, who was running the tapes. So we would record the program in California, ship the tapes to Charlotte. So uh, Jim goes to Charlotte to do, to help the local program and to kind of help set that up and calls me and says, come on to Charlotte. <laughs> we're, we're starting uh, a new network here. Uh, so he and, he and Paul had again decided they didn't agree totally on everything. And so we ended up moving to Charlotte in 1974. And that's where PTL and Heritage and all of that yeah, came started into off. place. Now, I think it's, it's interesting to point, point out here, when God gives you a vision I mean, you have a clear vision. A lot of times it doesn't necessarily, we try to put it with other folks and right. make, it, make it work. And that mm -hmm. can be fine for a season like it was. But eventually you've got to follow what God's called you to do. Absolutely. So, and this is where I, I think it's amazing that Jim, and of course that's where I, my, our connection was mm -hmm. there, and uh, uh, that he went and, and took hold of that. He didn't give up. And, and he kept pushing. Well, it was interesting because I remember I was in charge of scheduling crew. And I had this little desk that was literally in a hallway. It was just big enough that I could open my book and schedule the crew. And one day Jim comes up and I have a folding chair beside me. So if someone wanted to talk, they could open up a chair and sit down. Jim comes up, opens that chair, sits down. And he looked at me, he said, Dale, I have an idea. I said, you do? He said, yeah. And he takes a piece of paper and he starts drawing. He says, I believe Christians need a place they can go and bring their families. And he sketched out Heritage USA on a napkin or on that piece of paper. Mm. And that was, you know, in the late 60s. I mean, it, and it, it's, it felt so unbelievable at the time, you know, we were both extremely young and here he's sketching this out and says, I want to build that one day. And, you know, when, obviously when uh, he started building Heritage USA, I, remember, I reminded him of that little, right. get, you know, that little conversation in the hallway there at CBN. Yeah. Through the years, you kept your hand in television. Yes. You worked with a lot of different folks and a lot of different ministries and ministers. Uh, and then came KCM and Kenneth Copeland. Right. Tell me about your connection with him. Well... You know, I was young and crazy in the late 70s, and I thought, you know what? I believe I could put a remote truck, a television truck. I could open a production company. So I uh, got together with a guy named Marvin Luke and then my oldest brother, Johnny. And the three of us started a company in 1978, and we put a big semi on the road to do TV. My, my heart was to... Uh, take what we had learned through CBN and all and take that to other ministries. But I knew there wasn't enough ministries doing television then to pay the bills. So I had to do some sports and some other things just to keep the, you know, pay the bills. And, and uh, but we, we did a lot, a lot of productions and, and uh, it was a lot of hard work because equipment was big, heavy and all of that. And I was probably a little ahead of my time to be honest with you. But um, I, I, in 1978, we ended up doing a Kenneth Hagan <clears throat> camp meeting. You know, we sing, we sing, this is the day that the Lord has made. I'll be glad and rejoice. And I think some people think we're talking about uh, Friday. <laughs> no, we're not talking about any weekday or any day. What day are we talking about? <laughs> Bless God, this day of salvation, this day of the new birth this day of the new covenant, this day of healing, this day of redemption. That's what we're talking about. And that's what the Bible's talking about. He didn't talking about some day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Not a one of them. It's talking about this day. In that day, blessed be God, ye shall ask me nothing. But whatsoever ye ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hmm. And... It, I, don't know if, I don't know if that was the first time that they had ever recorded a camp meeting like this or not, but TBN was wanting to do something different. And so they, 
they called us. We went to Oklahoma, to Tulsa, and we would record, we recorded Monday services. This was back in the two inch tape, Mm -hmm. big tape. They would run them to the airport. They would fly them to LA and they would air on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So we were one day delayed, but we, we captured that entire conference. And I, you know, I remember some of those early days and, and, uh, and some of those early messages. I'll always remember Fred Price when he'd come out on stage. He'd say, you know, Freddie's ready. And it was just, you know, there was some interesting moments in that. And I'm not really sure if that's where we made the connection with the Brother Copeland or not. I've tried to get my mind to remember, but, but I do remember that was my first introduction to the faith right. group. Right. And um, I was so amazed and, and uh, with that whole camp meeting, just, you know, uh, had an impact on my life. Well, then in 1979, I received a call from Terry Pearsons, who was producing, you know, her dad's program and said, um, we'd like to fly out and see your truck and see if we can work something out. So she, they flew. Uh, we were based in a little town in North Carolina called Rocky Mount. Uh, and so they flew into Rocky Mount and you know, we had the truck there in, in the garage and they came, looked at the equipment and we started doing their, their recording their crusades. Right. And uh, that was great for us because they did nine a year. So we were, we were excited to have uh, someone that, that did that many events. But besides that, we felt like, okay, now we're working on what we're really in business to do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that was a great time for us. So you mentioned this is your, your, was your first entry into Word of Faith and Kenneth Copeland and this message, which was so new at that time. Right. Um, what impact did it have on you? Well, it was like, it was almost like the first time I heard about, uh, you know, the, it was the next step. It seemed like, you know, you first heard about the Holy Spirit. Now we're talking about Word of Faith. So it was the, you know, it was so new that it, it amazed me how the full gospel people who I thought would be all excited because now here's more we can do. Here's how we can get closer to God. And they're going, I don't know about that. Mm-hmm. And that intrigued me, you know, going, what, I don't get the problem here. You know, right. it's, it's, it's actually God drawing us closer. What's the problem? And, and uh, you know, we, we had a few people question us if we were doing the right thing, but uh, yeah. I was all excited. I, I, uh, I would take the cassettes back then home after the, the meetings and just listen to them over and over. Uh, my son grew up listening to Jerry Savelle. He thought Jerry Savelle was, yeah. you know, the most intriguing guy he'd ever heard. And he was just, you know, very small. He listened to Jerry Savelle over and over. So that, that message really impacted my life. So along comes 1982 and this crazy idea to do a world communion service. That was amazing. Tell me about that. Well. You know, to be a part of that, you know, I felt like that was the largest thing at that time that had ever been done. And, you know, as far as a Christian program, the great thing for us is we had worked with some of the uh, some of the sports groups. Right. And we had seen what could be done. So we we tried to bring some of that technology back to ministry. And, you know, there were so many things the whole television industry was experimenting with back then. And so, you know, I remember we, we, we received a call from uh, ABC Sports to do a college game. All their trucks were busy. Well, the intriguing thing about this college game, it was the first time that they had ever brought in a large semi with a satellite dish on it. And they, they sent that college game back to the network via satellite. And it was so unique because it made news that night, which I loved it because there was a shot of our truck in the background. Sure. Uh, And on this news story, and of course, ABC covered up everything on our truck with their ABC banner, which was okay. But my point is that's how new technology was. So to, to, to see what could be done, you know, and then to bring that, some of that same ideas back and see them happening here for a worldwide communion service was just phenomenal, I thought, because here we're using the same technology ABC is using right. to, to send a sport around the world. We're bringing it back and using it to do a worldwide camp meeting. 
Um, that was that was amazing, and I, I will never forget the first time that there was a there was a shot of the congregation at Dr. Cho's church, and they panned the crowd, and when that they took that shot and they panned the crowd, the people in the convention center in Fort Worth, man, they just stood up and cheered. And it was that, that there was a legitimate connection there mm. of Christians on the other side of the world. And at the, you know, we take it for granted today, you know, but then that was just very impactful. Yeah. You know, and that was, you know, now we don't think twice about connecting somewhere. Of course, right. we can do that, watch live from the internet. Exactly. But then to have satellite dishes, that was... Uh, was crazy technology. Absolutely. It was, it was way out there. Way out there. And, you know, <clears throat> still to this day, I, I'm, you know, I get excited thinking about Brother Copeland and Terry having the vision and the, you know, the idea that they could do this. If it had been across this country, it wouldn't have been such a big deal. But the fact that they connected Seoul, Korea, mm -hmm. that's what made it, you know, right. just so over the top, I felt. Right. And uh, that international connection was huge. You know, television was once only a dream. When every network station only offered news, Christians offered children's shows. As we explored this history, the questions we continue praying over is have we fulfilled the directive to take the good news to the nations? Or as Brother Copeland says, every available voice to get people saved and healed. When you listen to a show, are you hearing what will stir up hunger for God? In fact, here's a little tidbit for you. Did you know the movie, The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston was actually pitched by a pastor to a secular production company? We've all heard of that movie. Christians have had the chance to buy TV stations to get the godly message out there. And as you know, by watching TV nowadays, not many Christians really did. They just didn't have the vision to see it happen. But now, we can buy TV stations and we can add television networks on social media and on the internet like never before. The key here is a praying people who will create messages for all ages. That's huge. What will our kids and our teens and our young families feed on and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren? We all have avenues and voices like this phone that people never had before. I remember not having a phone. Do you? <laughs> I'm sure you do. A praying people make a difference. And I'm excited to read emails when you send them. It's great hearing you share what you're praying for and you're listening and asking God to do and what do you have next for me to do, God? We love hearing that, so don't stop because you make a difference. You really are learning to be the one. All right, thank you for coming our way today. We'll see you right here next time on Revival Radio TV.